So you're a front-end developer, and let's imagine you're working on an e-commerce website and you've been tasked to optimize it, improve the loading speed, the rendering, all the core web vitals, as well as the SEO. And probably the first thing that comes to your mind is that I need to take care of the rendering strategy. I need to choose one rendering strategy. And luckily, this is the topic that we're gonna dive deep into thanks to this great article from Alice Moore on a virtual website, because there are so many of them. They're all different, and maybe there's even a way to combine them. Without further ado, let's dive deep into this interesting topic. So first of all, what is a rendering strategy? Now, if we scroll down, uh, we're gonna get a really interesting example of a rendering strategy. So basically, rendering may seem like a jargon, but what it is, is basically, it gives us different ways of serving a meal at the restaurant. So imagine you're a customer at the restaurant. Well, the kitchen or the chef can pre-cook everything and then give you the pre-cooked meal, which is gonna be static rendering. They can refine the cold plates, meaning they can warm up your meal, but they already prepared it beforehand. That's gonna be incremental static revalidation. They can cook dishes as orders come in, which is gonna be server-side rendering and give customers ingredients, which is absurd, so that the customers cook them themselves, which is gonna be client-side rendering. But let's learn more about it and the use cases because every use case needs a different rendering strategy, okay? So first use case or first rendering strategy would be static site generation. And if we look at this diagram, which is actually a video, we're gonna see that our code basically builds first, okay? you basically build your source code. You spit out some JavaScript files. And then during the build, these JavaScript files are going to contact a database. It can be Firebase, Superbase, Prisma, whatever it is, it's going to grab the data from the or origin data and it's going to bake in that data. It can be basically a text for an article. And then it's going to deploy them. So we're going to deploy them on the edge, step four. And then as the users make a request to the network servers, as is gonna happen now, so it's also getting, getting cached, now it's deployed, user servers, request comes, and we get a response. Basically, the data or the app that has been built is going to live on the edge. It's a CDN and we serve the data quickly. Now, what are the ideal use cases for it? Basically, the content that doesn't change that often. It can be a landing page, basically any small landing page with a couple of other blog articles would be great because they're not changing, but they are very good for SEO and the loading page loading will be super fast. The reason it's good for SEO is because the indexer can parse them very easily, so you don't have to wait for the JavaScript to load in the background. It's a reduced server load because everything's probably gonna get cached on the CDN and the infrastructure costs are very minimal. Now, what you need to consider here is that, of course, you need to build this website. And every time you're building, we're gonna be making a request to the database in the background to basically re-render re that text. Now, here's the catch. If your content updates frequently, meaning if you're adding more and more blog articles every time, you actually need to rebuild this app to include those articles. And you have to do this for all the pages. Imagine you have 20,000 pages on your website. Every time you add one new article, you have to rebuild all of them. So this is not really good. And the last point is that this can actually be combined with other strategies. And also, there's one thing in to note as a best practice, which is considering incremental static regeneration for frequently changing content to, to reduce the build times. And which is actually our next strategy. So what is incremental static regeneration? It's basically the same as static site generation. So if we look here, we're gonna build the code and instead of fetching the data during the build time all at once, the code is going to be deployed first. And then point three, if we come here, so imagine your website is deployed and you have not rendered any data yet. As soon as the request comes from the client here, we're going to fetch this data from the cache, if there is 
already something cached. If not, only then we're going to request that data from the origin data, so from your database. And then we're going to add this to cache. So the next time user makes a request to this article or to this page, we're actually going to check it from the cache and most likely it's going to be there. If not, we're going to go to the origin data, to the database. So this will be much faster. And of course, if you have 20,000 pages and you add a new one, you're only, the, the client is only going to request this new one because, so it's going to be a cache miss. So a new article is not yet in the cache. It's going to be a cache miss. We're going to go to the database and then everything is great. So it's much better than static site generation if you have a lot of data. Ideal use cases when static site generation is too long for you. E-commerce product page pages, as I said, it can be a blog article or it can be a product page of your e-commerce shop because vendors always add new products to your, let's say it's Amazon and they add new products every minute probably. And you basically want to cache them too. Okay. And you don't want to regenerate the whole catalog of your products, new websites and large scale content sites. Benefits maintains the phase fast page loads of search site render, uh, generation, static site generation allows for on demand content updates, scales to large numbers, and can be more cost effective because you don't have to uh, spend all that computation power on generation, generating the whole thing again. Okay, of course, you need to manage the cache properly. And the best practices is that favor on demand. Uh, cache and validation because you need to take care of the cache and validation. Speaking of which, let's go and take a look at it. So first of all, I forgot about the static site generation and let's take a look at how this is going to be built. So without the data, you simply create an HTML and put your data into it. Very simple. And to enable static site generation, the only thing that you need to do is very simple. So you need to add this async keyword. Okay, I'm talking about Next.js. Maybe you're using a Gatsby or something else, but in Next.js is as simple as that. And then you make a request and it's going to be rendered at, right away. When we're talking about incremental static generation, regeneration, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a placeholder here. It's very similar to a static site generation. But now we need to also take care of the revalidation or invalidate in the cache as we saw previously. Meaning, when do we know when to take from the cache and when do we know when to actually go to the database? So this is going to, or you, you need to come up with the strategy. So you can either define a time based. So every 10 seconds, your cache gets purged and there's nothing in the cache, or you can attach specific, so it's gonna be starting from uh, version 12.2. We have on demand incremental static regeneration where you can create a unique token. And if you're, if you're an e-commerce website and let's say uh, you created a new content or updated, you're going to have some metadata on your main page that links to that piece of content. Or in an e-commerce website, you have metadata on the main page and then you can see that a specific sub page uh, price for the sub page has changed because the, the, the hash sums are not going to match this, this unique IDs are not going to match. And only then, you know, that you need reinvalid, you need to reinvalidate your cache. This is pretty interesting. I'm going to link, I'm going to leave all the links here for you so that you can read more about it, but let's move to the next point, which is service side rendering. Service side rendering is basically going to generate a full HTML page on each request. So not beforehand, not partially, but we're going to ship it to the client. And then every time client makes, makes a request, we're going to build a whole page. So let's take a look at the video. So it's going to go like this. We build the code, build the server, we deploy it. It goes to the client. Basically client makes a request. We fetch the data from the origin and when we generate this HTML basically. Okay. So wh when is it ideal? When you already have ISR on the majority, majority of user use cases, I would per personalize for dashboard pages because you know that it's going to be updating frequently. You need to update the content of the page on every request. 
social media feeds, for example, every time you refresh Facebook, you need to get new content. You don't want that to be cached, of course, and real-time data visualizations. What are the benefits? Always server fresh, up-to-date content, better SEO still than client-side rendering. We're still in a good SEO realm, okay? And um, some, reconsider some considerations. It's gonna be slower than static site generation, obviously, and incremental static regeneration. And uh, the time to, to first buy it, this, this is one of the web core vitals, is gonna be lacking because we still need to generate this page on the first user request. It's not gonna be sitting in our CDNs yet. We have to generate it as soon as the user asks, and we're gonna be waiting for that for a little. And of course, it consumes more server resources because we're gonna generate the same website every time the user makes a request. And some best practices is that you can implement some caching on top. You can use SSR streaming, which is already available with Next.js app router. You can use React Suspense, which is just a feature to, you know, show some loader, some, some skeleton of the app while we're doing this first rendering or fetching this render data. And you can, of course, optimize your database query so that it's even faster. Duh. All right, next point, or actually, let's take a look at the server side rendering. It's going to be very similar. You're simply going to use a get server side props here, and that's pretty much it. It's super easy to do it with Next.js. And I think Next.js is actually optimized for server side rendering from the early on. Now, what is client side rendering? Client side rendering is basically your usual React app, Angular app, Vue.js app that is not specifically targeted for server side rendering. This is basically going to be your client-side rendering strategy, okay? Just an, a single page app, just an SPA. And it's basically a relies on the content in the browser. And so what are the ideal use cases? User interactions with elements on a page that require immediate feedback, okay? We don't even make, want to make requests to render HTML. We're only going to make requests to specific APIs that are going to return JSON data, and we want to have an immediate effect as soon as the user clicks a button, for example. Admin dashboards with real-time data, amazing. And background task after the initial load. For example, Notion probably used this note-taking app. Notion is gonna make a lot of background work as you're typing because it's synchronizing it with other pages and so on. I actually have a video on this, on how Notion works in the background, just um, as a side note. And benefits are that it's great for user highly interactive user experiences. It can have seamless transitions because if you have application states, you'll say you have Redux, it's gonna be super fast and real-time interactions with external data. You can literally target any API super easily. Now, things to consider, the initial load. The initial load is gonna be slow, even slower than server-side generation, okay? And optimizing core web vitals can be challenging. Also, it requires careful state management on the client. So state management is gonna be a bit difficult, but if the app is complex enough, I wouldn't say the other strategies or at least server-side rendering is easier, any easier than that. Okay, best practices, maybe learn about code splitting, tree shaking, and basically use server-side rendering for the initial load, then you can hydrate it for an activity to have some progressive enhancement. Okay, and one last point is actually partial pre-rendering. It's not available yet, at least in Next.js. If you use it anywhere else, let me know in the comments below. What is partial pre-rendering? It's basically combining the best of all worlds. First, we're gonna basically uh, show a skeleton and then we're gonna pre-render the static parts of the website and then we're going to stream the dynamic content in. Imagine all the strategies that we discussed and you're combining the best part of them in within one page. But here's the thing, okay? As we said, you're working on an e-commerce website. Now, on an e-commerce website, how would you combine all these strategies um, on your, in your e-commerce website given that you have many pages? So let's take a look at the real world product rendering strategies e-commerce. So where would you use static site generation? You could use it for your homepage layout and static content. 
You could use it for category pages or of your e-commerce website, and you could use it for descriptions, specifications, or specific static product pages. Where would you use incremental static regeneration? You would use it for product listing with, with periodic updates. So products, lists of products that are going to be updated. You know, you have new products every, every time you refresh. Uh, with semi-frequent changes, for example, it may be the price changes, maybe the stock status changes, and user reviews. People can add reviews as, as you have users on your website. And server-side uh, rendering would be great for search page results, results or maybe for recommendations or real-time inventory checks, okay? And client-side rendering will be great for your shopping cart functionality because shopping carts are very interactive. You have an uh, add a credit card button, address button, buy, and so on. And maybe product image galleries, you know, the carousels, all, all of that can be done within a single page app and adding to cart and wishlist interactions, okay? You, we have some more examples here, such as web application or full stack AI application. I'm gonna link this, I'm gonna put a link in the description below so that you can come to this great website or a great article and check all of that yourself. I hope you liked the video and now you know what kind of rendering strategies there are and how to use them. As we saw the code, they are pretty easy actually. So it's a matter of basically defining a couple of things and it's gonna almost work out of the box. But of course, as the, the bigger the website is, the more you will have to add logic in the background. Okay, smash like, subscribe for more interesting content like this and I'll see you guys in the next one. Goodbye.